Hello, everyone. Welcome, coaches, athletes, parents, leaders. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to give everyone a few moments to join in on today's webinar. We're really excited that you're here with us, whether you're joining via Zoom or on Facebook Live. We appreciate you uh, for being here and spending your evening with us here today uh, for this important conversation on sports, racial justice, and how coaches can support their teams. My name is Marty Reed and I'm with Positive Coaching Alliance. I manage our national partnerships and we're a national nonprofit organization dedicated to creating positive youth sports experience for all kids. And before I introduce our amazing panelists, I just want to remind everyone that you can utilize the Q&A feature throughout the conversation or you can, you know, add your questions in the um, comment section on Facebook, and we'll do our best to get to all of your questions in time. But thanks again for joining us and tuning into this conversation today. Um, make sure you have your notepad and your pen ready because we're coming at you with some, you know, really great content, really great info. Uh, the Giants Community Fund, as well as Positive Coaching Alliance and Coaching Corps are partnering to support coaches with tools and resources to create engagement and best support their teams in this uh, ever-changing youth sports landscape. Um, this is the first of many in a series of webinars that we'll be hosting to support continued conversations for coaches um, and in the educational space. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our amazing panelists. Uh, joining me today, we have Gabe Kapler, a 12-year MLB veteran, World Series champion, and current manager of the San Francisco Giants. Welcome, Gabe, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Marty. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation with you and Suze, and I feel like it's going to be inspiring and impactful, so glad to be here, and thanks for hosting. Thanks, thanks so much. And also alongside me leading this important convo is Suze Sillett. We call her Suze. Uh, she is the Director of Education and Quality at Coaching Corps, the national org bringing access to quality youth sports coaches to communities of color. Suze has 25 years of experience in coaching and sports-based youth development. How's it going, Suze? Doing well. So excited to be here. Thanks, Marty and Gabe. Looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, I'm so excited to chat with you both. This is going to be amazing. You know, we've got coaches tuning in from all over the country. So I'd love to just start off with you both sharing your coaching philosophy and how would your players actually describe you as a coach? Gabe, you want to start off? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Maybe you're going to kick the Sue's on this one. Uh, yeah, no, I, th I think... I think our our players would describe me. Hopefully, I, I would like them to describe me as as flexible, um, as as empathetic, and and probably as as reasonable, um, and and somebody that really wants to ask a lot of questions and listen to our players' perspective. Yes, thanks for sharing. That's great. What about you, Suze? What's your coaching philosophy? Yeah, I think it's really about creating a space for kids to feel safe and connected. And, you know, it's such a great opportunity beyond the sport to really help them learn life lessons that really transcend away from the field and help them in their, uh, in their lives um, with their communities, with their families and, and in school as well. Yeah, absolutely. We're all speaking the same language here. We know the power of sports and the power it has to teach life lessons. So I'm really excited to you know, talk about this with you both. Um, Gabe, in a recent blog post, you actually mentioned that the best leaders assemble the best teams. Can you talk about what qualities or characteristics that you look for when surrounding yourself you know, with the best teammates? Sure, I think it, the same characteristics apply for teammates in the clubhouse, um, kind of teammates in, in personal mm -hmm. relationships and certainly from a, a, a team building perspective on, on a coaching staff. Um, I have a few things that, that stand out to me as examples of, of what good teammate behavior looks like. Um, I played in, in Boston in the mid 2000s and uh, you had mentioned there was a World, a World Series championship in there. I'm very proud of, I was a role player on that team, but mainly my goal was to be the best possible teammate. The captain of, of that team uh, was Jason Veritek, he's a catcher. Um, with multiple World Series rings and, and very well decorated. He was also um, one of the more selfless individuals I've, I've ever been around. 
So I remember um, walking down the stairs at Fenway Park uh, to get down to what at the time was a batting cage right underneath the dugout. And Jason was in there working on his swing. He wasn't swinging the bat, the bat great at the time. He was actually going through you know, quite a bit of a grind. And the first thing he did when I got down there was he got out of the cage and, and, and offered it up to me. I was kind of 23rd, 24th uh, man on the roster at that time. And, you know, he was probably the most important Red Sox player. And so I thought that was a really good example of how to lead by, by sharing. And so that's a, a major characteristic I look for. And then the second one is, is just being a really good listener. Um, I remember another time going downstairs in the middle of a season at a team hotel on the road with, with one of my former teammates. And he was just struggling away from the field, um, having a really difficult time. And he was just able to open up and, and share some of the struggles that he had, some of the family issues he was going through. And I really didn't have to say a whole lot of anything. Uh, I think being a good teammate um, starts by being a good a listener. And, and on that front, I'd love to hear Sue's and, and your perspective as well, Marty. Yeah, absolutely. Suze, do you want to share a bit about what it takes and some characteristics that you find in teammates? Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, I definitely agree with Gabe being a good listener. I think listening first, speaking second is definitely something that helps forge connection, not only with the coaches and the, the players, but also amongst the players themselves to really be able to you know, share what they're feeling, um, what's going on for them, and knowing that they'll be uh, trusted in an environment where they know that their teammates will listen to them. I think leading by example in the sense of effort and hard work. I mean, if you think about, you know, the team, like Gabe said, you know, 23rd, 24th player on the roster, um, you know, they can really approach their effort and really send a message um, to their teammates that no matter where you are, you're going to work, you're going to give your best effort. Um, and that really just rubs off on their teammates as well. And so really being able to recognize the effort and, and honor the effort as well. Everyone comes, you know, with their different, different uh, skills, strengths, expertises in different parts of the game and on the field. And everyone coming together collectively to work hard for each other, I think is uh, really important too. Absolutely. That servant leadership, communication, the effort and coming together. I mean, in my experience playing softball in college at UCLA, I mean, the teammates that I remember the most are the ones that just really had my back, you know, and that were huge support systems I can go to about anything beyond just the playing field. You know, they had that support and when it came to us getting out there and competing together, we knew that, you know, we were on each other's side. We were all going after a common goal. And, you know, these are still people that I turn to when I'm going through difficult times in my life today. You know, these are my best friends that I still connect with. So having that connection first was so key. And I think it's important for coaches to do that with their players, as well as teammates doing that with each other as well. Yeah, and, and something that, that Marty said uh, stands out to me, and, and that's like having, having each other's back. I think it's a, a really important theme in a clubhouse. And we kind of talked about the view from, from maybe the perspective of the 23rd or 24th person on, on a baseball roster. As far as the superstar goes, and, and maybe there are some stars of their teams out there that are listening right now, you can be inclusive just by asking for the opinion of, of other players. So... Um, Bryce Harper comes to mind for me. So does Manny Ramirez. Manny Ramirez is a, a really good example. He had one of the more beautiful uh, swings that, that I've ever seen and, and one that he could repeat over and over. But he would walk around during batting practice asking other players for hitting advice and, and tips. He did that fully by design. He, he wanted to hear the perspective of his teammates. He wanted them to feel included in his process, that's another form of having uh, other people's backs. So these are some of the, the teammates that have kind of shaped my view on it. And so in hearing you say that, Marty, it really stood out as true. Wow. And those are just great examples of, you know, creating that inclusive environment, making sure everyone knows that they belong, right? And that we're all in this together. I think that's just a great, some practical advice that those tuning in can use. Now, you know, 
Gabe, you've been quite outspoken when it comes to racial injustices that our country is facing, um, including being the first MLB manager to kneel during the national anthem. Can you give us a window into what conversations that you've been having with your players and maybe some advice on, um, you know, how to start these conversations, advice for other coaches tuning in today? Of course, and, and I'll bring it back to a concept that, that we've hit on a couple of times, Sue's hit on it as, as well, is, is, is listening, right? Um, so um, I spent a lot of time during this past summer talking to players around uh, the country and asking them you know, what they needed from, from us in, in the way of, of protests or not protesting for that matter. But I talked to a lot of former black teammates um, and I talked to some, some players on our team. Those conversations were intense. Um, we had them because we knew that we needed to have some of those dis difficult conversations. And, and I listened to players like Hunter Pence on our team who, who said this was really important to him. He wanted to, to use this opportunity to protest. And one of our coaches, Antoine Richardson, I don't think he would, he would mind. Uh, he's a black man from the Bahamas and, and shared how, how crucial it was that, that he took up this opportunity to use his voice and, and speak up. So a lot of the conversations turned out to be, um, how do we use our platforms to make the most possible change? That doesn't mean that we don't have the responsibility to take other action steps away from the field to do good work. We, we also have those, but we do have this spotlight. We do have these cameras. We do have these reporters who wanna ask us about these instances after the game. So. I guess a lot of this is about how do we make our voices carry as far as possible to reach the most people and to open up people's hearts and minds. Mm, that's so powerful. I mean, what you're talking about now, it's not, it's not easy to do, you know, it's not easy to be the first to do something or even, you know, take that leap of courage and, you know, use your voice and your platform um, for positive change, knowing that there's people out there that are going to, there's going to be naysayers, right? And people that don't want to hear this. So um, even when you step out and use your voice and can get discouraged in that process, some, sometimes even by people that you love and trust, has that ever happened? Have, had, have you ever received or did you receive any backlash, you know, after you took that stance and kneeled during the anthem? And how did you navigate those conversations with people that might have been indifferent? Yeah, no, I, I would definitely love to uh, address this question. I don't know if, if Suze, do you have any perspective on, on the protests from this past summer? I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And I absolutely circle back and share some of the challenges that players and, and coaches faced for protesting during, during last year's season. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, listening always comes first, like you said, and I think really being able at working with young people, especially is finding that age appropriate way to have the conversations and to really find out, you know, what are their perspectives? How are they coming to the table? Um, feeling about what's going on in their community as well. And really, you know, as a coach working with, with young people, it's really demonstrating and modeling that sometimes just you have to be courageous and, and stand up for what's right. And, and I think by modeling that, um, you know, for me personally, I'm able to support kids from any background in the sense that I am trying to work with them and hear them and share with them and, and hopefully lead to demonstrate what I'm hoping is a better place for our team, our kids, our communities, and our country. So great. Leading with that moral courage is so important. And stepping out, leading by example. Any advice for in those moments where it seems tough and maybe a coach who or an athlete out there listening in who might want to use their voice and their platform for change, but might feel discouraged or might be turned off by someone who came at them in the wrong way and are thinking about giving up at this point. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great one to address. So important because like I mentioned, we had myself and, and Hunter Pence and, and Antoine Richardson who, who saw, and others by the way, like many others who, who saw this as an opportunity to speak up and, and to protest and, and to share that we were just not okay with the systemic racism in the United States. There are others who, who may feel passionately about those same topics, 
but may not have as de developed or potentially refined um, positions on these matters. And, and so with them, I generally come with a high degree of empathy, understanding that that's not where they are and meeting them where they are um, and not trying to force anybody to do anything that they're not comfortable with. Um, I did hear players say things like, uh, I wonder what it would be like if I, if I protested, but then maybe a police officer friend of mine felt um, uncomfortable with that. So there were some, some nuance to this. And, and my main takeaways were not that anybody was indifferent, not that anybody didn't have, have strong or, or passionate feelings on these topics, but maybe just that they weren't 100% developed in, in those positions yet. Perhaps they had a little bit of fear for what would happen after the game when they had a microphone in their face and had to defend those positions. And it does take time to, to feel confident enough to say, okay, I'm willing to do this and I know exactly what I wanna say what message I think will carry best after the game. So um, I, I just, I really recognize that it's not the same for everybody. First of all, not everybody has the same political views and not everybody has the same appetite for protest. So as a coach, as a leader, I wanna make sure that I'm empathetic of their position as well, put myself in their shoes, how are they feeling? Wow, and you mentioned empathy. I mean, I think that's, that's a topic that's been coming up a lot lately and the importance of making everyone and others feel heard and seen and heard, right? Um, Sue's Coaching Corps recently uh, just released a brand new Coaching with Empathy training. Can you tell us a bit more about, about that training? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's such a important moment in time um, to be talking about empathy and we've really kind of looked at empathy as the foundation of how um, coaches should really create that culture with kids. Uh, empathy really forges connection. It opens up kids' minds to different possibilities, different uh, viewpoints. Um, and so we really wanted to be able to create a training uh, that really offered simple, easy to use tools for coaches to think about how they approach empathy, but also how they can help kids develop it um, amongst themselves as well. That is great. I'm very excited about this course. How has the training been received so far? And, you know, what do you hope coaches gain from going through this training? Yeah, I think um, what we hope coaches get out of it, and this word's been said today already, is um, really appreciating and understanding perspective. You know, kids show up, they're on a team, they all come from, you know, different backgrounds, they have different stories, different experiences, and the importance of really listening to those stories and listening to those experiences I think, um, you know, the goal is really listening to understand versus fix. And I think that's really hard for coaches, right? Like it's in our DNA to fix things in the game, you know, like the game plan's not working. So we have to adjust, you know, the tactics or, or who am I going to have um, come in to pinch hit? And you're thinking about those things. But as far as like working with young people and the challenges they bring, um, to practices like we don't have to fix them necessarily there are certainly things that we can't fix we can't solve systemic racism we can't um, change you know violence in a neighborhood but we can create safe spaces for kids um, and see beyond our own perspective and I think a lot of it too is you know really taking off our own glasses so to speak and not look through our lens but really understand um, you know, the perspective of young people it really makes a huge difference, creates a safe space um, for everyone to belong. And it's been received well so far. You know, it, we've released it just to a few um, of our partners. And I think a common theme throughout is for them to really have a shared language around empathy and how to use that in, in practices and with their kids. Um, you know, I think understanding trauma and the perspective of kids and how it may trauma impacts kids goes a really long way in creating that safe space. So yeah, we're really excited. Um, we actually are gonna launch it nationwide next week. Um, so the training will be available nationwide to all coaches um, at no cost for a limited time. So we're definitely excited to get empathetic coaching going around the country for sure. 
Absolutely. And we'll be sharing more of those resources in the chat box for those tuning in to tap into that because that's so important. And honestly, when you're talking about listening and listening for understanding, I mean, in this work and also understanding marginalized perspectives out there, it takes listening to those that have viewpoints and upbringings and backgrounds outside of our own, right? And really getting to know people um, who, who might have a different way of doing things from different backgrounds, different cultures. I think it's important to not only listen, but value and um, you know really understand their perspective. So I thank you for sharing that. Gabe, you know, when it comes to empathy, how have you been able to model empathy with your players and how do you get your players to model empathy with each other? Yeah, I think this is a really nice opportunity to piggyback on, on something that, that Sue said. Um, and, and it was about kind of taking away the attention on like the tactical part of baseball and, and focusing it on, on the human being underneath the uniform. Um, so one initiative that is important to me right now is understanding that we have a great group of coaches who are really good at getting in the weeds on things like mechanics and arm angles and, and hand positions and pitch sequencing and, um, and approach angles, like all of these things that are so technical about baseball, they actually don't need me to get in the weeds with them. So that means I can focus my attention on, on what's going on for them at home by way of example, habit creation, maybe something that that's bugging them that they just haven't re really been able to open up to anybody else about. Um, those are the most important jobs that I can do right now. Like, look, like our, the cage work isn't going to suffer. The bullpen work isn't going to suffer. There's going to be plenty of people to focus their attention on that. We can also have a group of coaches that are, are really just focused on, on the listening and feedback that's necessary to, to kind of both support and to raise the bar for our players. Um, and, and learning as much as I can in those conversations will almost, because I've been in their shoes as a player, create that empathy in me, me demonstrating being comfortable um, displaying that empathy will in turn to directly to your question, will um, encourage them to be more empathetic themselves to once again, call back to something that Sue said, leading by example. So, so true, leading by example and continuing to be willing to listen and learn and grow, knowing that, you know, we don't have all the answers and it's important for us to continue to have an open mind, right? And continue to learn and continue to grow. Now, I'd love to share about our Sports Can Battle Racism Initiative that we actually started uh, back. We launched a new workshop in October and the whole overall initiative is really a focused effort to use our platform to really see positive change, you know, in our country. And um, this includes our roundtable webinars and um, bringing together thought leaders to have those tough conversations. Um, and the curriculum development, we are actually going to be launching a workshop for athletes um, next month in March. And um, this athlete course will cover a multitude of different things from, you know, understanding your own identity and unconscious bias um, and valuing diversity, increasing knowledge about racism. We actually go through a little bit of the history of racism and, you know, how to respond in those tough teachable moments and, and how to create those safe, inclusive environments that you both are talking about. So I think it's really important that we are all working together and it's not just a conversation. We go beyond that and we, um, you know, see action as well. And I think, um, Everyone on here is doing a great job of really turning these conversations into action as well. Now, we do have a lot of um, parents joining us today as well. And I know you both are parents. So can you share with us, you know, from your experience, how parents can have conversations with their children to help improve race relations and really use the power of sports as a teachable moment? Yeah, I have a 10 and a four year old, so a little different from Gabe's perspective, but I think that'll be cool to kind of hear approaches from with different age kids. Um, you know, for, for my partner and myself, we always start the conversation with um, the privilege that our boys have um, uh, with our 10 year old. It's like understanding as a white person, a white boy growing into a white man, like he will have many benefits in life and what about those who won't receive those benefits and we just start to have 
some conversations around that um, and look towards current events to really kind of expand that a little bit in an age appropriate way. But I think it's important to start the conversation when kids are, are younger so they can really start to understand it as they begin to grow. And then I think using sports, I mean, there are so many different uh, wonderful examples of, of sports teams and leagues um, stepping up to do the right thing around social justice and racial justice and using those as examples, I think are really great ways to highlight it. Absolutely, thanks for sharing that. How about you Gabe, How, what kind of conversations have you been having with your sons around this topic and how have you seen their growth as well? So those, those conversations are becoming more and more productive. My, my sons are, are now 19 and 21. So every year that goes by, they're teaching me more um, mm -hmm. and they're reminding me how important it is for our sports by way of example, to create um, diverse leadership teams. So mm -hmm. a lot of now these conversations are being led by them, what they want to see from professional sports teams so that they're going to be willing to watch those sports. And, and those values are just, um, they provide me with, with a lot of pride. I'll say this, um, this kind of goes back to what Suze was saying about leading by example. I do think that having the conversations is critically important. It's much more important what I, in my opinion, what um, my sons saw in my house in the same way what I saw watching my mom and dad. So my mom and dad were both activists. Um, they were both um, protesters and they spent a lot of a lot of their their lives um, marching in, in civil rights protests and also in anti-war protests. So this was um, a value that that was passed on to me. They they shared pictures and they shared details of the policies that they weren't comfortable with. So they they talked to me like I was adult about these topics when I was a kid, and they didn't try to shield me from from anything. Um, and then I, I try to do the same with my boys and. One other thing that came up is I know that I don't know everything. So I'm okay looking a little bit uncomfortable at times in front of my boys. I'm, I'm okay saying like, I don't know the perfect language that I, that I should be using to describe, describe this particular topic. And hey, I might get this wrong, but I'm gonna do everything in my power to learn as much as I can and, and to keep my ears open so I can get it right in the future. Um, you know, kind of make myself human and, and you know, I think that's important as, as a father is, is not to, to come off, you know, bigger than life. So around, especially around these conversations, sometimes acknowledging and calling out some of, some of the discomfort can be really valuable. And I think it's an interesting segue um, back to a topic that I'd love to bring up with, with both of you and Marty in particular, because you mentioned having the difficult conversations um, in webinar form. And I think what that does sometimes is I wonder if I'm going to say the wrong thing here. I wonder if this is going to come out incorrectly, if I might get ridiculed about, you know, how I articulate my thoughts here. And I wonder, like, how do you put people at ease when you're putting a webinar together where people feel comfortable maybe not being right or, or potentially even saying the wrong thing? Right. Well, we, we normally start off and let them know that this is a brave space. Like in our workshops, when we're talking about these tough conversations and, um, Talking about race is not easy because we aren't used to having the, these conversations on a public platform. So letting them know just off the top that this is a brave space and be willing to learn and grow. And with that, mistakes are going to be made, you know, and the important thing isn't that you made a mistake, but it's acknowledging that you made a mistake and learning from your mistakes and doing better next time. Just like in sports, you know, we make mistakes, but when it comes to growing and learning, that doesn't happen without making mistakes. So don't be afraid to make a mistake. Don't be afraid to mess up. We're not here to win arguments, we're here to listen and learn from each other. So really setting the tone there at the mm -hmm. start of the conversation. So it really puts people at ease to really open up and, and get vulnerable with us. We have to start off with our vulnerability as well. I usually like to start off sharing why this conversation is so important to me, because when I'm vulnerable, it welcomes and opens a space for everyone else to be vulnerable as well. Do you have mm -hmm. anything else to add, Suze, when you're having these conversations about empathy? Yeah, I think listen, being willing to listen and learn is, is huge and also being responsible for how you are in the group and understanding that perspective, I think is, is really important. I think 
as coaches, we know continuing our education is so important and it may seem easy to do when we're talking about X's and O's, but um, really, you know, stepping into yourself and being vulnerable to, to learn about things that go way beyond the sport itself. Um, those are the, those are the important things that we should all be talking about, you know, as coaches. So absolutely. Really you. Yeah. And Gabe, when you mentioned also just being honest with your kids and letting them know that you don't have all the answers, right. And having that vulnerability with our kids is important too. Um, and them seeing, you know, adults as examples, like you mentioned, your parents really paving the way for you. Um, and I think representation matters as well. And, um, you know, I grew up playing softball and I always dreamed of, you know, seeing a female or being a female in the W or in the um, MLB. And um, I think it's important to recognize that uh, Alyssa Nacken, who will be featured in Coaching Corp's Game Changer Awards uh, pretty soon here, is the first full-time female coach in MLB history and the first coach to be on the field during a major league game. Gabe, can you talk about, you know, the impact of having diverse perspectives um, and gender equality in your coaching staff and how that ultimately impacts the development of your players. Sure, uh, so diversity is very important on a coaching staff. It's, it's critically important when it comes to direction setting um, and, and decision-making, policy setting and, and things of, of that nature. And um, so we build uh, a staff to try to reflect multiple perspectives because one thing we know about pro sports right now, I don't think it's any secret, is it's a pretty homogenous group of, of decision makers and, and direction setters. So, and it's you know, mostly white men. And in order for us to kind of expand um, our ability to reach more players, in order for us to think more creatively, to think more critically, we're gonna need a, a a different style of thinker. That oftentimes comes in the form of diverse backgrounds. And, and then as it respects to, uh, or as it relates to Alyssa, um, she has done all of those things in spades since she came on board. So she has made every conversation better um, through, through bringing a new perspective to those conversations. I think she has done a really nice job of bringing somebody else's perspective to the dugout from the coach's room and making sure that, that players and staff both have it on the field. And, you know, just quite frankly, she has dug in with our players in a way that I haven't seen a, a coach do in, in many years. And excellent knowledge of outfield play, excellent knowledge of base running, led an incredible base running discussion today, right before I got on this call, a Zoom call, um, where we were all kind of sitting back and, and, and watching her lead the way. She got the job uh, with the Giants through beating out a wide range of very experienced candidates, and, and she kind of nailed it at, at every turn. And I think what, we, um, what we're driving towards now is creating a pipeline of, of more Alyssa's, and not, not just Alyssa from a gender perspective, but a, a diversity of thought perspective and um, like very different socioeconomic backgrounds, racial backgrounds, and again, back to the diversity of thought. That's the most critical thing that I can I can share as well. Mm, so good. And uh, Suze, to that point, you know, knowing that Coaching Corps really is out there recruiting and training and providing quality coaches in underserved communities, uh, what are your thoughts on getting more coaches and di with diverse background, more female coaches out there because we know how important representation is and we want to see more Alyssa's. So do you have any advice for recruiting more diverse coaches? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the diverse perspectives is so important. And, and when you think about what kids see when they show up to their fields and their practices, we want kids seeing uh, coaches who they know they can become when they grow up. So they need to you know, look like them and, and really be able to aspire to that. So thinking about uh, getting into um, increasing numbers of black and brown coaches and getting um, more women coaching as well. Um, I think it's really important. Um, and Alyssa's role is, 
is really powerful in this is if you think about a little boy seeing a woman as their coach, then they see women in leader position, positions and they're gonna grow up um, understanding that women can really you know, be in the boardroom or the head coach. And that's a really important, I think, um, a message for, for boys as well as girls to really understand that and, and to see that. Absolutely. And I think when you when you can see something in front of you, it's the, the, the odds of you becoming it is so much bigger. So it's very important that we have more representation. We have more diverse backgrounds, more diverse people, and we come together and not just have them at the table, but give them a voice while they're there as well to impact change. So I think that's so important. Thank you both for your perspectives there. And uh, for the coaches and parents who are listening in, you know, this is a very, very tough time in youth sports, you know, going through the pandemic, getting back into playing in some places and still kind of, you know, on that sports hiatus in other places. What's some advice that you have for teams during this pandemic on how they can, you know, connect, continue to connect and um, keep kids motivated during this difficult time? Yeah, I think you said it, connection. I think that is such an important aspect. You think about remote learning, remote um, sports practices. It's so hard to stay connected with, with kids right now. And if you think about the digital divide as well and all the different resources that a lot of kids don't have, um, I think number one, coaches should be thinking about how can I stay connected to kids and we certainly want them to still be physically active and, and be healthy, but I think mental health is such an important aspect of it right now. And really just asking those questions, how are you doing? You know, and being willing and vulnerable to have those types of conversations with kids, I think can go a long way right now. Yeah, and I, and I think like, um, so I think the physical activity is so critically important for children. And at the same time, um, this is a, a medium and um, a way of connecting and communicating that my kids were way more comfortable with than my peers, right? And now, you know, kids that are now 10 years younger than my own children are even way, way more comfortable with it. So text, social media, Zoom, like these are forms that we can really reach them. And, and, and actually we're coming on their home turf in a lot of ways. So I, mean, I don't want to take away from how difficult it is in the current time, but they're pretty well equipped to learn and connect and communicate through these mediums. Right, right. Yeah, and I think providing that support throughout the process and reminding them, especially the those, uh, I'd say, overly developed and competitive athletes that, you know, their self-worth and their value is beyond, you know, their ability to perform on a field, right? Mm -hmm. Just reminding them their self-worth and, the, and, and the things outside of sports is just so important that they know because that mental health piece is so, so important and crucial right now. And we are getting a lot of questions from uh, the audience. So I do wanna take some time to ask from some of our listeners tuning in. Um, the more we learn about vulnerability, the more it appears to be the secret sauce in so many interpersonal dynamics. Can any of you identify an example of when you experienced the power of vulnerability coming from the fiercest of competitors? Go ahead, Suze. <laughs> question. Oh. Uh, it's an anonymous question, but I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I think humility is so important. And, you know, I have coached a uh, a competitive girls team with players who have gone on to play college and professional and I'm like these girls know as much as I do like let's let's tap into that and being just up front with hey I don't know all the answers no one does you may know some of these answers and so really using that Socratic method to let them share and inspire and motivate and teach um, their teammates, I think is a really, it's an important thing to do as an adult and for kids to see adults doing that. I think it really sends a message to them that they're valued. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, as, as Suze was talking, I thought about Das Prescott and his willingness to kind of talk about some of his, his mental health concerns um and some of the things that were checking him up and 
how difficult it was for him to perform under those circumstances. Um, so that I think is a really good example of, of vulnerability, public vulnerability, where all of a sudden there were other people who were willing to talk about some of their mental health concerns. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, I think many, many of the folks on this uh, call are, are probably aware of the Drew Robinson story that, that just came out. Um, Drew is, is one of our players with the Giants and um, he attempted suicide earlier in, in 2020. Him coming out and telling his story in a very, very public way um, and, and basically sharing every last detail of what happened to him and with the help of, of some really great reporting, that story became and continues to become um, a call to action for people to, to, to come out and, and tell their stories as well. And if we can get to a place from a mental health perspective where um, the stigma is removed in pro sports, where it's not weak, but strong to talk about mental health concerns in the same way we might talk about a physical injury. I have, mm -hmm. you know, my hamstring is a little bit tight, you know, instead of saying something like that, maybe it's like, look, I have this thing going on at home and it's, it's getting in the way of, of my ability to perform at my highest level or having some really extreme anxiety and hoping that there might be somebody at the ballpark there that could, could help me, you know, work my way through this. So that level of vulnerability that these professional athletes have shared they're, they're working towards um, removing stigma around mental health in, in pro sports. And being that example and being willing to share that story, he's saving lives, you know, it's very powerful and important to be shared. So thank you for bringing that up. We do have a question from Aiden Barrios Martinez, he's nine years old. Um, and he wants to know, Gabe, have you ever coached another team? And how do you get into a major league baseball team? <laughs> Yeah, so I would before I was the the manager of the Giants, I managed the Philadelphia Phillies for two years, and before I was the manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, I was uh, the farm director, the director of player development uh, for the Los Angeles Dodgers for three years. So um, I got to see the game from a, a couple of different perspectives, and um, I was able to 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 manage in two very very different cities in in Philadelphia uh, and in in San Francisco. And then with respect to like how you become a, a major league player, I imagine you're talking about becoming a major league player. It's Aiden, right? Is that right? Uh, yes, Aiden. Okay, cool. So for, for Aiden, um, right now you're nine years old and, and just like have as much fun as you possibly can. Whatever it is that you love to do on, on a baseball field, whether it be like throwing a tennis ball against a wall or, or sliding practice or diving for baseballs, do that thing that you love over and over and over, and you will give yourself your best chance to move on. Don't get too technical right now. Don't stress the little things. Just enjoy the crap out of it, and that will, that will give you your best chance to advance and succeed in sports. Love that answer. I mean, sports is fun. You know, we do this to have fun. And I think a lot of times when people think of positive coaching, you know, they think of it as fluff or everyone gets a trophy. And, you know, I'd love to hear from both of your perspectives of what does positive coaching, you know, mean to you? When you think of positive coaching, what does that mean to you? I think it means building kids up and and you are as the coach, you're, you're along for the ride. It's all about the kids. Um, it's about building them up. It's helping them develop. So you're offering constructive criticism, but in a way, because you have the end goal of a kid setting goals and trying to achieve them, not necessarily winning all these games, but thinking about personal improvement and team improvement and really, um, kids leave feeling good about themselves and wanting to come back the next day. I think I'm so glad that Sue's mentioned um, some constructive criticism when it, when it comes to positive coaching, because I don't think that necessarily you see those things as going hand in hand, but they're absolutely critical to the buy-in from players at any age. Like I think if you just kind of pump a kid or athlete full of, um, like positive feedback when, when it's, it's not really the right kind of feedback that they need in the moment. I, I don't think they buy it. I think they know that, that it's not authentic. And I think they go somewhere else to look for something that feels more true. So leading with, so two things, empathy and honesty 
is, is really po positive coaching. So understanding that um, delivering a message is going to have an impact, whether it's you know, positive or, or it's, it's not positive, but then like putting yourself in their shoes and how are they gonna be, be hearing that message? Um, because ultimately they have the same goal that you have. You wanna you know, make them the best possible athlete that they can be and the best possible human they can be. And with that comes honest, a, a necessity for honest feedback as well. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with both of what you said. I mean, when we think of positive coaching, we think of creating an atmosphere that supports the best possible performance. And that involves, you know, really being willing to challenge your athletes, but also be that caring adult, not sacrificing the human spirit in the process. So focusing on that process and not just on the results. And I know Sue's mentioned this earlier, that effort is so important, even when the effort is un or, uh, unsuccessful, when the results are unsuccessful, but if the effort was there, that matters most. And, you know, creating an environment that are, we're challenging our youth so they can learn and grow, but we're also support, supporting them through that process with truthful, specific praise. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you both for, for sharing that. Um, we do have another question from an audience member um, based on something we talked about earlier, being uh, um, vulnerable and having these tough conversations, but then might receive some backlash, you know, when it comes to Black Lives Matter and the whole movement and some people that might not understand or agree with some of these things or try to politicize the conversation. Um, how do we continue to unite groups where um, you have people that might not even be open to having the conversation? You know, they said you mentioned empathy before, but for those who are against it, what have you both found as a good constructive way to navigate those situations? I've really just approached it from a place of it's about human decency and respect. And so we don't necessarily have to politicize um, what we're talking about, but when we're talking about human beings on a, on a team or associated with a team, it's about the culture that we create with them, the where everyone is valued, seen, heard, um, and understood. And I think if you approach it from that perspective, you can at least um, bring a sense of, of honesty to the conversation um, while, you know, being, you know, if you have to, careful about the political nature of it. But I think being courageous and, and having the conversation and reminding folks that we're talking about, you know, treating everyone um, with respect, um, I think it's important to start there. Yeah. Absolutely. When, when I think about a, a clubhouse space or, or locker room space, and, and in my mind, I'm picturing players kind of sitting around an area in a circle, people from all different backgrounds, native Spanish speakers, native English speakers. I, I think the best way to approach that room is without statements of, of what we what we want to accomplish and instead with a bunch of questions. So, so questions in that environment rarely go wrong. So a question like what frustrates you about this is an awesome conversation starter. And then sharing, you know, like you have to reciprocate with some information as well. It's not an interview, but then other people stepping up and saying, Here, here's what frustrates me. Okay, cool. What inspires you? What do you want, to, what, what do you wish was different? It's amazing when you get into a room like that and you ask those questions, you see a whole lot less conflict because everybody's in their own minds thinking about the things that that they're feeling and experiencing. And so, you know, you could go in with a conversation about social justice, but without labeling it as such and just ask a bunch of questions and all of these things will come out. And I get the sense that if everybody has a chance to speak, uh, people are going to feel heard and respected. That's how I'd approach a conversation. Great advice. And that's very tactical and like easy, tangible to take away um, from this conversation for those tuning in. Very important to ask questions and listen for understanding and not just to respond. So thanks for sharing that. Now we do have more of a technical question uh, from an audience member. He asked, Gabe, as a leader, how do you marry analytics or analytics? when making lineup in matchup situations while ensuring that the players remain both motivated and not discouraged due to not playing or having limited playing time? 
So it's a really challenging question. And what I'll say is I've changed and developed on this particular topic over the years. Uh, I would say when I first got the job in, in Philadelphia to be their manager, um, I, was, I was a little bit more cold, a little bit more calculated as it related to lineup decisions and, and in-game strategy. And as I developed into, into year two in Philadelphia and now heading into my fourth year as a manager with the Giants, I, I recognize that um, those, those very cold, um, calculated, on-paper, tactical decisions, they have, um, they have a fallout. So maybe you're getting a small tactical advantage by placing a specific player somewhere in the lineup or using a relief pitcher um, to wipe out one particular hitter on the, the opposing team. But somebody else is feeling the impact of that as well. And the player who may not have been expecting that or prepared for that moment he may not have as much confidence in that moment. So it, it really is kind of, um, it's a mixing board rather than a switch that's on or off. So if you think about a switch, it's on, it's all analytics all the time because that's the, the, the strongest way to win a game. Or if it's off and it's all about confidence and, and, and the well-being of the player, you kind of miss the nuance. And these are really nuanced conversations. So I think about it more as a mixing board than a switch that's on or off at this point. Yes, great advice, great advice. And I think um, it's, it's just really important to remain open-minded in these situations. And um, at the end of the day, athletes have to know that you care, right? When you create that connection first, then you receive that commitment. And they're more open to listening and understanding those types of decisions that you have to make. Um, so uh, that's just, just really awesome, knowing the, how you navigate those types of situations. And when it comes to this, conversation that we're having about race and, you know, social justice, and you both have been a part of using your platforms for activation and positive change. What has been, you know, the most challenging part of all this for you? And what has been maybe the most rewarding part when it comes to this activation? I think rewarding is certainly that you were in this work to hopefully have an impact and, and contribute to our teams and our community. And, you know, everyone plays a role in that. And, you know, our role at Coaching Core is a small piece of that. We, we are um, really focused on collaborating with everyone in our communities. Um, and we're there to listen um, and learn along the way as well. So I think rewarding is, you know, making sure that you know, we're just one person, one organization at a table with hundreds of other people who are experts in, in what they do. Um, I don't really have a challenge. It's all, it's all good. <laughs> Gabe, what about you? Yeah, thanks. I, I think um, the same things that are challenging are also rewarding in a lot of ways yeah. with respect to this. So um, one thing that, that comes to mind is that we are in an environment where the bar is constantly being raised for us. So by way of example, if a player or, or a coach sends a really cool tweet that supports a, a marginalized group, that's gonna be applauded and people are gonna say, hey, way to go. But then there are gonna be some voices who say, so all you're gonna do is post on social media. So then that player or that staff member, you know, takes an additional step They're Maybe now they're starting to have the hard conversations around um, e equality, uh, diversity, inclusion. Um, and so we talk about that. We're having these conversations and somebody says that that's great, but there's another step that you could take. You can get out into the community and you can actually get your hands dirty. Right? So it's this constant raising of the bar, which, which makes it a challenge, but then you step up and meet the bar every step of the way you, you start an organization there, there is more, that is hands-on. You're actually taking part in hiring processes. You're challenging other people's biases in these processes. You're challenging your own biases in these processes. And, and what ends up happening is people are constantly raising the bar for you, but if you're, if you're really listening, you're also gonna keep stepping up to, to meet those bars. And so the same things that are, that are challenging are also rewarding in this environment. 
So well said. Absolutely. And whenever you're, you know, living your life out loud and and using your platform and making a difference and being outspoken about these things, you will receive some backlash. You will receive some people that might not agree. So you have to be ready for that and um, know that it's it's something that can't stop you from continuing to move forward and continuing to stay on this path. So I really appreciate both of the, your perspectives there. We do have another question from the audience before we end here. Um, this question is to Gabe. From a diversity perspective, you managed Team Israel in 2013. Were there any concerns or different preparation for managing an all Jewish group of players and also a team representing a country that faces a lot of public criticism? Mm. Um, it's so interesting. I, I remember that time period. I don't remember any of those issues uh, being, being brought to light. I'm sure that they were being talked about all around us, but they weren't things that, that we were especially focused on. I mean, certainly it was a, a group of, of players that were, were large and staff members that were uh, largely Jewish. But I remember there was one staff member uh, who I had worked with in the past who was not. Um, I don't think he felt at all ostracized from the group by any stretch of the imagination. And when you think about the World Baseball Classic, it's kind of interesting, right? Like the concept is, is actually, um, it's more about coming together from those specific backgrounds <laughs> and nationalities. So if you think about, you know, the Dominican team and in, uh, in the WBC, like that's a group of, of Dominican players. So by definition, it's, it's probably a less inclusive group. Um, so maybe that's not the, the time, um, although like diversity is always going to be important. Coaching, diversity of coaches is always going to be important, but the WBC specifically around that time period was sort of designed to um, put the, you know, put these teams around each other. I hope that makes sense. I know that's uh, maybe a little bit, um, a little convoluted. Oh, it does. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, knowing that teams, not all teams are very diverse, you know, and in some moments where you do have diversity on teams, we could see a lot of clicks, right? We have to be proactive as coaches to make sure that just because we're all on the same team doesn't mean that everyone's going to be united together. So what are some ways that we can avoid clicks being created? With, that's another question that came from the audience. Suze, would you like to start? Sure. Yeah, I think it's important from the beginning to um, focus on the team, specifically around getting to learn about each other and know each other. And so really creating time within practices for activities that aren't necessarily related to the sport, uh, parent shares, group initiatives, problem solvers, things where they have to work together to figure things out um, or learn about each other. Um, I think the human connection is where appreciation of difference starts. And so the more you do those types of activities together, you bond as a group and um, hopefully negate any of those clicks starting. And if they do, I think it's important for the coach to really make it clear that that's um, you know, not the way we do things here. Well said. Anything to add to that, Gabe? Yeah, so clicks in baseball are, are, are super fascinating. <laughs> and most of the time they, uh, they start because they're, they're language clicks. So you'll see the native, we obviously in baseball, we have large collections of native Spanish speakers, Venezuela, uh, the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Colombia, Honduras. Um, we have a, a really cool representation in our clubhouse. With that comes some language barriers. So one of the greatest gifts a teammate, we, we started this conversation um, around teammates and think it's kind of appropriate that we may be ending it on teammates. Um, the, the right players who will bring the Spanish speaker into the, the conversation that's Engl in English and vice versa can be critically important to a clubhouse. And I can remember on, on all of the teams that I've been a part of, um, a, a guy by the name of Joel Peralta stands out as an incredible connector to be able to bring a Spanish speaker into an, an English conversation. Kevin Millar was awesome at it um, during, during my years in Boston of bringing Manny Ramirez, Manny Ramirez and, and Pedro Martinez over to the conversation with Trot Nixon and, and Jason Veritek. So, um, yeah, I just think like it's an intentional thing. We have to, and Sue's pointed out that a coach sometimes needs to step in. In a major league clubhouse, we really want our players to police that sort of thing. 
and, and police isn't even actually the, the most effective or appropriate word. I think the, the right one is probably, uh, you know, to ask for inclusivity. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, thank you so much. And I think I, let's end with everyone just sharing maybe a resource, a book, a podcast, something that you've used in the last few months that um, our audience can refer to. Yeah, I really enjoyed the Netflix documentary, The Playbook, around uh, different professional coaches and how they go about their craft and, and their lives working with their teams. I loved it too, yeah. Thank cool. You. Yeah, I'll have to check that out um, and report back. Um, so for me personally, I've been working on, um, so I, I'll give two answers. One is the foundation, the nonprofit that I've been working on called Pipeline for Change. Uh, Pipeline for Change is, is an organization that, that wants to see uh, a, a very diverse group, including um, people of color, um, women, members of the LGBTQ plus community, non-binary people, marginalized communities in decision-making positions in professional sports um, for all of the reasons that we discussed today. So that's a resource um, and, and we're, we're online and hopefully we'll find a way to, to share that resource for others. And this, this one is uh, my second resource is maybe a, a, little less, um, a little less serious, but it's Atomic Habits, which I think is a really phenomenal book for athletes. And it's a super simple concept of of trying to get 1% better every day through um, improved habits and processes. Awesome, great resources. Everyone tuning in, you heard it here. Please tap into these resources. We're gonna share a lot in the chat box. I hope that you've been uh, really enjoying this conversation. I just wanted to take a moment to appreciate both Gabe and Suze for joining us today and continue to check in and access Positive Coaching Alliance resources, Coaching Corps resources, and also the Giants community as well. And we just thank you so much for your time today. Um, and we'll see you at the next live webinar. Have a great, great evening.